Okay, so um, Michael, it sounds like uh, you're on um, uh, discussion about uh, compartment API. Yeah, um, if you'd like, what I'll do is I'll share the uh, briefly share the um, uh, the Microbium API because of because of its similarity with the compartment API, and some of that similarity is intentional, and then maybe that'll lead into some of the questions that I have to ask um, about the differences. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Which one is it? This one. Let's see if that works. Yep. Okay. So. Um, oh, I didn't. I did not realize how micro VM is spelled. That's very cute. Uh, yeah, I changed the I changed the spelling last week on account of the fact that npm already has a micro VM library. <laughs> Um, and this is easier to Google for as well. So I thought it, it's a... Uh, <laughs> I really like it. It's a quirky spelling. Um, okay, so the, the API here, I've sort of distilled, uh, distilled parts of the API that are relevant to this discussion, uh, uh, relevant to the modules uh, onto this page here. Um, so uh, is the size okay for everyone? Can you see? Yeah. Um, okay, so Microbium, uh, the Microbium NPN module. Um, so I, I should step back a bit and say Microbium is a is a uh, an interpreter or an engine for JavaScript, um, a subset of JavaScript, which is a very small subset at this point, um, and it's still in development. So it's even smaller than it will be at its final point, um, and uh, it works. Similarly to how XS works in the sense that there's a bytecode com compiler um, and it's designed to run on uh, microcontrollers, but there's also a node, a node interface for, um, for using a Node.js host instead of a microcontroller host. And part of the design intention is to create these uh, 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 virtual machines uh, on a on a desktop host or something more powerful, where you can uh, do things like importing and parsing source text, and then create a snapshot which is represented as as compact binary bytecode, and that snapshot is then uh, transferred to a uh, to a more resource limited host such as a microcontroller. Um, so the the part of the interface that deals with with modules is um, is this Node.js interface uh, on a sort of a more powerful host, um, and that's this interface. Well, part of the part of this part of the interface is, is represented by this type signature here. Um, there's a create to create a new virtual machine, um, and there's a corresponding restore if you want to restore one, but that's not covered here. Um, and then there's a there's a global this. You'll see that this, sound, this sounds very familiar to the compartment API um, for accessing a, um, the globals. In, the, in this case, because it's an actual virtual machine uh, outside of Node, um, the global this is a is a proxy of of that uh, of the a proxy whose properties are the global variables on uh, in the uh, in the virtual machine. Um, and then the key part that I wanted to talk about for the modules is this uh, import now um, uh, method. And there's a, there's a corresponding hook, but the hook is not provided in the create. So that's this one of the, one of the fundamental differences between the two uh, APIs. Um, how, now, how, how are the, how how is the hook provided if it's since you don't have the options bag on create? So there is no uh, there's no options in create um, that are relevant to modules. Uh, what the way that I did it um, is described down here. So when you provide okay, so the import now um, import now method takes a module 
what I'm calling a modular source, which, which is an object that contains the source text and some other stuff, um, which I'll get to. And it produces a module object. So this, this is quite different to the compartment API. Compartment API import now accepts a, uh, a specifier and uh, I believe it re returns the module object. Um, uh, in, in the case of Microvium, the, uh, what, what's given is actually a representation of the source text. Um, and it is literally the source text. There's no, uh, there's no uh, module static record or uh, anything like that. I'd like to make a request, which is mm -hmm. uh, for APIs that are kind of covering a similar territory on functionality, Mm -hmm. uh, if there's a particular method name that mm -hmm. is defined with a particular signature and a particular semantics in one of the things that are in that general functionality space, that a method, another method that's in the same general area, but with very, very different type signature, uh, and yeah. uh, significantly different semantics should have a different name. I, find, I, I would find it upsetting uh, if your thing went out with overlapping names that had completely different signatures. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I've, changed, I've changed this name probably close to five or 10 times since I've designed it because, uh, and finding a name that doesn't overlap with something because we've got a number of different uh, methods in the compartment API, um, whether it's import or module or uh, or evaluate. I mean, there's a couple of different different things there. So um, this I'm open thing to suggestions. It, yeah, Sorry. because this thing does not take a specifier because it actually takes mm. source text. Mm. It's much more like evaluating a a module source text than it is like import. Mm. Imp every time I've seen the term import. It's been associated with with uh, starting with a specifier. Uh, okay, that's, that's a good point. So maybe it should be something like evaluate module. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's 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 a good point. Thank you. Okay. Um, and by and on the other side, on the module object, is the module object like what we've been calling the module namespace object? I believe so. Um, yes, I, I believe so. I'm, I'm not sure if the if the reified module namespace object is an exotic object. Uh, that that's that's a question I have on the compartment API. Um, this is not. This is just an object in the same way that the Node.js documentation refers to module. Uh, it'll say require returns a module, which is an object. Uh, it's an um, object that, wh whose own properties uh, reflect the exported variables of the module they represent. Yes, yes. Okay. But it's not an exotic yeah. object. Okay. So yeah, the, exo the exoticness of the module namespace object in the ECMAScript spec, uh, it is exotic, but it's not very exotic. Uh, if you just implemented it as a regular object, um, uh, whose own properties have the, the required behavior, which you can do without anything being exotic, I think mm. nobody would pretty much notice. Uh, okay. The only thing that's noticeable is the data property getting an odd right to it. Oh, the fact that the, fact that the data properties can only, the behavior of them uh, uh, can only be implemented non-exotically with accessor properties. So if you just make them into accessor properties, then you don't need anything exotic. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but the, the, the only behavioral issue that I'm aware of, uh, Bradley, correct me if, I, if I'm not, if I've got this wrong, is the temporal dead zone issue. And the temporal dead zone issue is only observable in import cycles. Uh, correct. Um you would need to have some sort of hook, which is unlikely for a remote object to resolve that, because then it would require an asynchronous access or blocking remote API, which most people don't want. Okay. Oh, uh, the other thing, I'm sorry, uh, uh, besides temporal dead zone, the other thing is uh, the live binding 
aspect that uh, the exporter of the um, uh, of the module namespace object, the module, the code in the, that module can update the value of the property, whereas um, uh, the code holding the module namespace object uh, can see the updates but cannot cause updates. And once again, that's trivial to do with getter setters, uh, and it's um, or with getters in this case, uh, and it's um, not possible to do with non-exotic data properties. There's a, um, there's a behavior that we have not yet defined in spec um, that we may choose to do. Uh, the, so in, com in the compartment shim, I've been fiddling around with uh, getting intercompartment to linkage to work. Um, and at the moment, Mark and I have, uh, are operating on a premise that uh, an idea that there would be a new function on the compartment that would allow you to get the module namespace object before it has been loaded or executed um, in order to use that to refer to a module in that compartment when passing that namespace as an argument to another compartment's module map. Um, and that allows us to, um, to create intercompartmental linkage that the compartments can um, so, so that compartments can walk the import graph, uh, the import graph from one compartment to another, and execute all of the modules together um, to link and, ex and then execute all of the modules together. And in order to do that, we have to provide a module namespace object that has um, that that has no defined interface at the time you receive it. Um, Meaning that we do not we do not know what getters and setters it's going to need after the module has loaded because we do not know what its exports will be, and um, in the shim, I'm modeling this as a property that uh, that refuses all uh, that, that throws exceptions on all interactions until those properties have been defined as if that they were as if they were reference errors. Um, yeah, and, and at that and at that point, the at, at that point, the the module namespace object, uh, as proposed by the compartment proposal, uh, will become very exotic. It will be you know, exotic enough that can only be implemented faithfully uh, with a proxy. Okay. I mean, only to um, only be shimmed faithfully with the proxy. It can be implemented, of course, directly once it's once we have a a coherent proposal. Okay. Um, yeah, so the module object in this context is, uh, it is actually <laughs> implemented as a proxy uh, because of course it's, oh. a, it's, it's, a mo it's a, an object returned from the import now uh, method and the method is existing in the host, the Node.js code. Um, and the, uh, obviously the module that's being imported is being imported into the virtual machine. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a proxy whose, uh, whose properties reflect the global variables in the virtual machine. Um, but you can, yeah, uh, it behaves as you would expect a, a local object. So you can, you can extract uh, the exports almost as if you had require uh, had executed require or import um, on a local on a local script local module okay, good so let me let me ask some questions about my uh, microvm or uh, do you, do you given how it's spelled do you mind people calling it microvm yeah no microvm makes sense yeah it also okay. makes sense for americans to get confused and pronounce it microvm <laughs> yeah <laughs> Aluminium. Ah, 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 Got it. Got it. Um, <laughs> Don't get me started okay. on that one. <laughs> so, okay. So you said that uh, what you're trying to do is not implement all of JavaScript, but implement the subset. Yes. Um, and what is the if, so? First of all, uh, is it intended to be a subset of SCS? Um, I. 
I, I need to still get to that point. Um, I would I would like it. I mean, it would be great if it could be a Jesse uh, interpreter. Um, if, it, if it could, if the subset could be exactly the Jesse subset. Um, but I need to see that J the Jesse J subset. JSC uh, JavaScript. Uh, the the you're talking about the Apple JavaScript engine in Safari. I think you meant Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, my oh, oh. my okay. weird accent. No. Okay. Okay. You're going for a Jesse subset. Okay. Very interesting. That, that's a that's a target I have on the horizon. Um, okay. Whether it turns into that or not, uh, we'll have to see. It, it depends. Uh, I'm just um, I want to sort of get a minimum viable product of some some language, and then uh, that is a subset of JavaScript, and then okay. grow it uh, wherever wherever it makes sense to grow it. Okay. So Jesse is already trying to be approximately the smallest viable subset of uh, SES. Um, uh, uh, is there, do you know that there's parts of Jesse that you want to omit from the subset? Or might the subset turn out to be identical to Jesse? Um, I'm, not, I'm wondering if the immutability side will be, uh, will create some, uh, will make it a little bit impractical to use in some scenarios. Um, also, there were a few things that were omit, omitted that might be quite useful um, for, uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly, but perhaps for, no, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna speak further on that. I did look into it a few months ago, but I haven't, I haven't looked at it recently. My, my expectation is that it's, it might fit, uh, it might not be a perfect fit, uh, because there, there might be some, some aspects of it um, that make, uh, that make it difficult to use. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Well, well, very interesting. Okay. Uh, okay so that's another, it. Mm, another, sorry. another question. Uh, mm. Your your create operation on your um, uh, interface microbium. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, you're using a uh, you know an interface language here. Uh, and you're naming something static create. Is that intended yeah. to map to a JavaScript constructor or actually to map to a me static method named create? It's a static method named create. Uh, this, the document here is sort of written in pseudo TypeScript. It's not really, um, you can't really do okay. this in TypeScript. Um, it's, okay. The reason it's not a constructor is just because there's a complementary restore function. So you can create uh, and then snapshot and then restore. Um, ah. And both of them, both of them create a virtual machine, but the one is restoring it from a snapshot. Okay. And when you create a new virtual machine, clearly uh, from this API, I would expect that uh, each new, um, you know, instance of you know, each new microbium instance has its own new global object. Um, does it have a fresh set of primordials or is it sharing the primordials? In other words, um, each new instance will have a fresh set of primordials. At the stage of the implementation, there are no primordials, so it's not, <laughs> so it's not an issue, but the, each virtual machine is completely independent. When you say independent, uh, the caller of create mm. is getting is 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 let's say in microbium a uh it calls create creating a microbium b but the microbium microbium object that represents microbium b is returned to the code in microbium a who can then do a dot global this so clearly the object graphs can become freely entangled just like they can be both across realms and across compartments. Um, so, uh, so if you're creating new in, new primordials versus sharing the primordials, is definitely observable. Uh, yes, yeah, it would be a, a, in this example or in these examples, the host is a the host of a virtual machine is a Node.js uh, process application. Um, so there's the host and the virtual machine. 
I think that if you had two virtual machines, uh, two microbium virtual machines uh, sharing objects, it would be indistinguishable. Uh, the, the objects exposed to one virtual machine, would, uh, whether they come from the host or another virtual machine, would be indistinguishable to the, to the receiving virtual machine, that they are just uh, exotic objects uh, implemented externally to the, to the virtual machine. And that includes things like um, uh, the, the, the object that uh, is bound to the name object, for example, or the, 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 the global name array. Uh, that would be um, as if I compare the, if, if code in um, micro VM A uh, use it, compares array triple equal um, uh, microbium B dot global this dot array. Uh, mm. The answer would be that they're not equal, or that they are. Yes. Okay. Okay. So this this is really analogous to the Realm API, much more than it's analogous to the Compartment API. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit of a mixture, given that it implements both the hooks and the uh, and the Realm. Okay. Okay. Um, so then the other, th the other side of this equation is if, the, uh, if import now is importing module source text that itself does importing and there's no import hook provided to the constructor, um, then what does, uh, how is the import hook provided? And the answer is, uh, let me find this here, um, that the module source objects, the object that you provide to the import now hook or evaluate module hook as it will be, um, takes the source text, but it also takes this optional uh, hook. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to call it a hook because it's the implementation of the importing. And the, the signature of that is, is probably more like what we would, what we would call a, an importing uh, signature. It takes this, the module specifier as a string and returns, uh, again, a module object. Um, and again, the requirements here for the module objects are completely flexible. So this can be an object that resides in the host, or it can be an object that resides in the virtual machine or another, or another virtual machine. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's not specified what, what that needs to be as long as the properties on that object map to um, the, the logical exports of that module. Whether that, whether that module actually has physical exports depends on the language it's written in. Um, does that make sense? Uh, it's, it's making, it's, it's, I'm still processing it. Uh, what I've, process so far seems to make sense, yes. So this um, encapsulates all of the behavior of the resolution, the, re the resolve hook and the, um, uh, uh, the import hook of the compartment API, in that it's taking a specifier and doing whatever it requires, whatever is needed to turn that into a module object. Um, and another critical difference between this and the compartment API's hook is that there's no referrer. Um, so this will be related to one of my questions that I'm gonna ask after this. Um, but the module hook is provided, oh, sorry, the import hook is provided on a per module basis. When you import a module, you give it the hook for that module's importing. So the referrer becomes implicit in that there's a separate uh, in, instanti or potentially a separate instantiation of each uh, import hook, or uh, separate instantiation of the import hook for each um, module that's being imported. So and that's why. I, mm. So um, my first, the, the thing I'm most puzzled by here is, uh, so there's, you know, somebody's written a package that consists of a bunch of modules. And they're importing each other by name in some context. Hold on. Connection request from I'm getting a bunch of zeros to connect the, to the device. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. This is not a Zoom thing. This is a completely separate thing that my 
um, Machine was asking me about, which I don't recognize. Um, the um, uh, so 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 it, you know it's it, somehow um, in any of our systems uh, we end up trying to process a bunch of source code sitting in a directory into a set of um, linked module things uh, uh, according to policy decisions about uh, who can see what and renaming and all that. Um, and uh, so the so the the question is <clears throat> how does one how do the policy decisions that have been somehow expressed somewhere turn into uh, import hooks that are provided on a per module source basis? And how, do the, how does this import hook that's specific to this module get into the module? Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps there's two answers to that. Perhaps there's two things that will answer your question. Um, the one is, uh, let me see, do I have it here? Um, I've got, um, got an example uh, that uses the, uh, where is it? Oops, no. Uh, yeah. um, sorry, I'm just looking for it. Export, import, import dependency. So, this is this is example an example written in Node.js that uh, uh, exercises import now providing a import an import dependency uh, method uh, or callback um, and I don't know if this if seeing it might help explain it but this is taking a specifier here. It's ignoring the specifier here. The policy would be that all specifiers resolve to the same module. Um, and in this case, the module is just this object that has a, a, an export uh, named X, logically has an export named X because the module, the module object has a property named X um, with a value of 10. And the, the imported module can then uh, therefore uh, import, import that module, doesn't matter what the specifier is here. Um, and get access to that to that value. So if you had other policies, you'd implement them. You could implement them within this uh, callback. You could say if the specifier is this, then do this. Okay. You, it encapsulates the module map and encapsulates the resolver, encapsulates the the, the caching or memoization uh, behavior. Um, all of that. All of that is within this this callback. Um, and perhaps the other answer to your question comes in a more complete example, which is using uh, what I've called the node style importer. This is a function that I've built in. It's a utility function built into the microbium uh, library, um, but is separate from the virtual machine itself. And it's designed for hosts running in Node.js uh, that, have act that want, want to have modules that exist in the file system as opposed to modules that exist somewhere else, like a database or whatever, whatever you may want. Um, and uh, the way it works is that you call the node style importer, you give it some options that tell it the, basically the policy decisions. Um, this, is, this is not, in, this is not um, loading up uh, many manifest files or anything like that, but it, you, you could imagine one that did if, if your policies were captured as external text files. Um, and the node style importer uh, yeah, just takes some options that say basically what, what, is the, um, what is the behavior you want. So here you can access, uh, modules can access other modules that are implemented in the file system. Um, that, that's just a typical import like uh, dot forward slash something that's that's a specifier that's um, that that would resolve to the file system. Uh, it specifies what what directory to look in. It specifies a bunch of modules that are uh, that are uh, that are not what what's the word that are absolute in a sense. Like in Node, you can say import uh, if it, import from fs. 
uh, and it doesn't matter where where the importer lives, uh, it always refers to the same uh, imported module FS. So um, th there's no sense in which the specifier is relative to the importing module. So that's what I've called core modules to match the name used by Node for these kinds of modules. I, I um, would agree to use the word absolute for that kind of specifier, and it is distinct from full specifier. Okay, sorry, you say absolute is a better term? Absolute is a fine term for the type of module identifier that you're using there. It's not one I think that we have introduced in our vernacular in the specification, but it is a distinction that is necessary in order to express how node links uh, module specifiers. Okay, so FS is an absolute specifier but a full specifier would be one that has a like a full file path uh, and that no. kind of thing? No, a full specifier <laughs> is, uh, is like a canonical specifier in the context of a compartment. Um, and uh, which is to say that, you, and correct me if I'm wrong in my understanding, Mark, but my, uh, my understanding of the meaning of full specifier is that it is the result of having resolved a, uh, an import specifier from one module against, its, uh, against the refer module specifier. And the okay. semantics of that, uh, the semantics of resolve can produce either absolute or relative identifiers, um, especially for nodes semantics where externally linked identifiers are always absolute and internally linked specifiers are always relative. But both can I, be. So I didn't follow the node specific part of that discussion, but the, the first part which, uh, uh, is completely correct, which is the the resolve step is to do all the refer relative processing to turn it into names that are compartment relative, but not refer relative. So the full specifier still has a meaning only in with respect to a compartment's namespace, but now uh, irrespective of what the refer is. Yeah. Independent yeah. of what the refer it, is. It's the canonical name um, in the context of a compartment. Yeah. Now, now, what Michael's doing here is very interesting, which is by just providing a procedurally defined mapping on a per module basis, and then having constructed the module objects by calls to um, you know, what's, what is currently import now, uh, essentially what you're loading system is doing, um, your you know, node style importer system is doing, is it would then be using the, the, the API that Michael is showing uh, once per module, uh, providing the right functions to each module individually uh, to, do, to make all of the decisions about, about um, when this module uses this name, what does it mean? It's the behavior of those functions. And because you're providing the function directly on a per module basis, you've got full expressiveness without having to introduce concepts like refer relative versus not refer relative, et cetera. Um, uh, I think that the same issue that we encountered um, uh, when we started with the module namespaces as the thing designating module instances uh, that uh, you'll encounter, uh, which is uh, in order to do cyclic linkage, you need to be able to create a module object from a, in this case, from your case, a module object from a source text and an importing function without, before you initialize the object. So the, so the import, so, so let's, go, let's go back to your, your, your type signatures at the, at the top. Okay, so, so parallel to import now, um, there would be 
uh, a, let's call it module now for, for no good reason. Uh, but module now has exactly the same signature, uh, but the difference is that module now only creates the, mo the module object without populating it and without, um, without doing any further linkage. Uh, it's only associating the source text with the hook and with the compartment, uh, but it's not, it, it's not itself doing any further linkage um, and it's not doing any initialization. And that's what you need in order to hook these, th in order to wire these things together is you need to reify them uh, before they're initialized so that you can have them to wire them to each other and then when you've got a complete graph, then you can do the importing or evaluation that actually um, does the initialization and the transitive linkage. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, I think that that problem of I mean, this is basically for circular dependencies that you have uh, your uh, your imports are re-entrant in the sense that you can import the same module while it's being imported. Um, and it's quite a, it was quite a difficult problem to, to uh, find a, a simple solution to. Uh, I mean, there are complicated solutions that, it, that are easy to implement. Um, but the, the solution that I went for in Microbium, um, let's see, do I, I have an example of a, a cyclic import here. So here, um, uh, so here we assume there's already a VM created. Um, so here the import hook, uh, if I can call it that, the callback um, is the same for each module. Here I've got two modules, um, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, and in this case, it takes a specifier and it just looks up uh, it's assuming the specifier is absolute here. Yeah. And so uh, it looks up the specifier in this modules table. Um, and if it's there, then it calls import now on the, um, uh, given the source module in this import table. So the source modules here include, so they have for each module name, uh, or each module specifier, they have a, uh, a source text. Um, and uh, and then the callback because the callback is provided per per source. Um, and here we've got source text for module A that imports module B, and source text for module B that imports module A. Um, and each one then has a corresponding export. And then the entry the entry here is just to uh, call the import hook, which is just a function that takes a specifier and returns the uh, module object. I call it on the absolute specifier for the entry module, um, which is probably how you would typically do it anyway. Um, it's just that normally you wouldn't write your own uh, hook. You would use the node style importer, but this demonstrates what, this demonstrates a simple case of a, a cyclic dependency um, or circular dependency uh, with without having all the complexity of the node style importer. Um, so this imports module A, or triggers the, the evaluation of module A, uh, which then tries to import module B. So the VM is gonna hit the import dependency uh, hook for module A, which is gonna find the, um, uh, find the module B in this table, and it's going to then start executing module B. Module B is then also importing A, so that's the, the cycle. Um, A has not completed import, importing yet. Um, so uh, let's see, have I, got the, have I got the printout the right way around? I haven't actually executed this example. I have other examples of cycles, but I, 
don't know if I've executed this one. Module A. Uh, okay. Yes, no, no, that's actually wrong. This this is supposed to be undefined, and this is this is supposed to be ten. I think I've I think I've written the the printout the wrong way around. Uh, I don't understand. Um, could you? There's there's a, a bit of. Um, whatever you're using to display this, there's that raw copy extern in oh, white. Sorry, yeah, okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you. Okay. So import dependency takes in a specifier and returns the result of import now. And import now, of course, depends, will cause these uh, import depend, you know, cause these. The, the hooks to get called, which in this case is always import dependency. So import dependency is certainly recursive, which is not surprising. Now, you start by calling import dependency on the name module A. It looks up the module source object in the modules record under module A, which is the thing that begins on um, uh, with uh, begins on line, you know, goes through from line six to through 11, um, ignoring the, the curlies. Um, and so import now will, will again call, so since import now is supposed to return a module object um, uh, as that, that corresponds to the initialized module, uh, from what I understood earlier, it's supposed to do what, what we normally think of as import, as, as actually getting the initialized modules if possible. It will call import dependency um, uh, with the name module B while it's while we're still in the midst of um, that first call, and. Um, uh, when it calls it with module B, it's going to do. I think you have you've got an infinite depth uh, recursion here. I don't think I don't think that um, I don't think this bottoms out. I think so the one if it does bottom out would be if import now is memoizing the result. Uh, if, if memoizing but the there's result, no, but it, if it, the it, key. It, no memoizing the result is not adequate because there is no result yet. The recursion happens um, on, on, you know, on the descent, where nothing has returned yet, mm -hmm. and until so, things return, there is nothing to memoize. Yes, but before it, before before it recurses, it can make a note that I've been here before, and to return this ob uh, return the object, I will eventually return. But but um, it doesn't know that it's the one that's going to return the object. It's not in a position to decide what the object is that will be returned. Right, because it doesn't have access to the cache key, right? Well, and also because the other import dependencies that that it's recursing over aren't necessarily itself. So the the way this works, um, yeah, assuming there's no bugs and I've thought through it correctly, um, the uh, the import now method, which will be evaluate module method. If given the same, uh, it is specified to if it's given the same module uh, source, will return exactly the same module object. So I think this is what Chris is saying as well. Um, okay. It's it's memoizing, um, it's memoizing on the instance of the module source. Oh, okay. So so, so, it's, so it's at that point the module source, I'm sorry. At that point the object that it's memoizing is. Uh, is uh, empty. Yeah. So the yeah the process of importing creates a, an empty object, and it can populate. At the moment, it's cheating. It doesn't populate the properties, but it has access to the source text. So it could uh, populate the the properties of that module object with undefined and make sure it's not extensible and all of that. Um, so. Could I just see the source code? Because I think there's a temporal dead zone problem happening. Even if it's undefined, it should really throw. 
uh, because you're exporting the declaration that refers to an exported declaration. Um, that uh, means, so, so could, could you so, it's, so the correct behavior is to throw? Yeah. Uh, okay. Can I see the other code? Because, because uh, yeah, I, I, I couldn't, uh, like, I can't remember exactly how it was. So, okay. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. yeah, since they're both declaration statements, uh, one will have to refer to the other. And since they're both still being declared, then we assume that the infinity of this will be throwing for temporal dead zone accessing uh, before it's, uh, oh, before it's okay. minimized. Okay, I was going according to the Node.js uh, semantics for require, which is not exactly the, the oh, yeah. standard. So, so yeah. I'm actually incorrect on that. But okay, so so that the, yeah, I've got the semantics wrong there. Then um, that's unfortunate that you can't have cycles. Well, okay. it, that, you that, mean vars, you, and and you've assigned to a var. Um, yeah. In the second line, then one of them will be undefined uh, when it's referred by the other. Okay. Uh, okay, I understand. Um, okay, that doesn't really change the discussion too much. It just means that the getter for the module object uh, it needs to throw throw if that um, property hasn't been set yet. Uh, okay. If if that if the binding, if the variable it's bound to has not been set yet or this defined is, yet. This makes um, sense. I think that the test case, the next test case d deeper down this rabbit hole is more illustrative um, where um, uh, it, having import cycles, uh, having cyclic dependencies and the live binding um, where assigning to a, uh, assigning in the source, uh, assigning mm -hmm. To a, a property of the origin module would affect um, the uh, the exported values in multiple modules um, mm -hmm. might not be expressible this way. Um, the, the the bindings are live here. The shortcut I've taken in the implementation to date, which I'll, I'll address in future, is that the bindings are bidirectional, so you can actually mutate and import and it will mutate the original um but uh, that can be a that can be addressed quite easily i think down the line mm. um i i can do a test case for it just to make sure i mm -hmm. i have other uh test cases for uh cycle dependencies they're probably testing for the wrong thing now that i understand the the temporal dead zone scenario better oh. The temporal dead zone also gets more complicated because there's a thing called hoistable declarations in the spec, of which function declaration. Yeah, uh, they're they're not interchangeable. Like, if only we had common JS or ESM only, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. But they can they can possibly be interchangeable for practical purposes as long as within ESM the behavior is correct. Uh, the behavior when importing a uh, a host defined module that is uh, common JS, uh, it probably doesn't need to match some. Uh, it doesn't probably need to match either specification exactly um, because it's a new. It, it would be a new uh, cross-module importing style that hasn't been defined previously. Correct. That's what Node does for its built-ins. They're a very special case thing to provide a facade on both ends. Uh, okay. Um, I do have a quick question about um, uh, top-level await in this context. Um, could it could it uh, could it be a way to if, if we put uh, print b after an await zero? Um, would that solve the issue? Um, I'm not sure. Um, Brad, do, do you do you know like how the um, um, top level await has altered this? So since there are no siblings, it shouldn't do anything weird. If there were siblings, things get really, really hard to predict because you're running in parallel for siblings. Mm -hmm. 
So before print mm -hmm. if we do an await zero, uh, would that uh, would that mean um, module B continues? Smartphone connected. Uh, if you did await before print B, it would get the value because uh, B will have finished evaluating, for sure. Yeah, but then a, a, a yeah, and a would have been exported. So so yeah, that would have solved it. In this case, poor Mark. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm, I'm trying to simulate in my head the the cyclic case with the caching behavior that you described, because the caching behavior seems like it solves the problem, but I can't make it work in my head. What what happens is that oh sorry, the this first import dependency before it actually executes this module will uh, cache an association between this source text object and the module object, which does not uh, is not yet populated but is instantiated. Um, and then it will evaluate the the source text. Sorry, um, the, is the who's implementing the caching? So the the Microbian VM uh, implements okay. the caching on the level of the the association okay. between the source text objects okay. so, and the mm. right. Okay, so the import dependency function here. Mm -hmm. going to depend on it to do the caching. Import now is the uh, thing exp that's, that's provided by the VM. So it needs to do the caching. Um, uh, it, okay, okay, let me, let me just talk through what import now does in, in sequence uh, to make sure I understand. It first, creates the module object that it will be returning. Mm -hmm. It then registers that module object as the one to be returned uh, if this module source, if it's asked to import this module source object again. Mm -hmm. Does it do that caching based on the identity of the module source object or based on the contents? It's the identity. Um, it's the identity okay. of that. Okay, that, that's <clears throat> fine. Because it will, when we come around, it will have the same identity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, so it registers um, that object as the thing to return if it's asked to import this module source text object. It, do, it does that registration before it does any further processing. Then it parses the source text, finds the name module B, calls the associated import hook, which happens to be import dependency in this case, um, uh, which will call import now on module B, uh, which does the same thing for B. And then when it gets to the step, where it's calling import now with the source object for module A, uh, mo the import now will first check, do I already have a, a module object cached for this import object, for this source object? The answer is yes. Therefore, I just return it in its empty state, in its uninitialized state. Mm -hmm. uh, and yes, I, I, can, I, think I, uh, I think you're right. I think it does work. And, and Calbert, you were right as well. That is what you have in mind, Calbert, correct? Yes, that, that is what I expected. I, I was surprised that it was based off of the object identity, but um, it's certainly mm -hmm. the only way to make it work without specifiers. So does that mean that we can do something similar uh, so in order to avoid introducing a separate um, uh, uh, module method, 
for creating <coughs> initialized module objects? Can we just do all of the wiring during the import recursion, depending on the caching mechanism that we have anyway, the, you know, the per compartment uh, memoizing mechanism by having it do the memoizing early, we can still just do it during import and not have to do any other wiring. Is that possible? So um, let, me, let me answer that by restating what we've seen so far uh, first. So uh, essentially the MicroVM API is sort of like the inverse of the proposed compartment API, where the inversion, an inverse in terms of inversion of control, where um, the machinery of doing linkage and loading, uh, um, instead uh, of being uh, inside the compartment is outside of the compartment. And you've only exposed the part of the API that's necessary um, to facilitate linkage from the outside. Um, and because of this, you have an opportunity to use the object identity of, of uh, effectively your um, uh, of, 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 of the linkage in order to in order to to make these short to take some to, to short circuit these these uh, these loops. And it might be possible, I think, to express um, ESM semantics with reasonably high fidelity this way. Um, and I think it's yeah, and it's I think it's worth looking into. The um, as for whether so this, this of course brings up the question: Should we pivot the compartment API to be more like this? And part of that is uh, part and, and and the crux of that is like: Could we avoid having to expose something like the module function? Um, I think with the compartment API, where the machinery of loading and linking is internal to the compartment and across compartments. Um, I think you do need to have that module function um, in order for the machinery outside of the compartment API that's assembling packages to be able to uh, to be able to communicate to the compartments how they are interlinked. Um, it might make sense to have the entire assembly, uh, the entire pro uh, process of linkage outside of the compartment API. Um, in which case both inter-package and inter-module linkage would be problems left to the user. Um, my intuition about whether we should or should not do that is that we should not because there's sufficient, because what we what I've found from fiddling around with the compartment shim so far is that the machinery that is encapsulated by the compartment API is sufficiently general that you can express the semantics of both um, node style resolution and web style resolution. And because, um, and because of the generalization fits inside of the compartment API, there's some utility to not f having, uh, not exposing that to end users to have them, you know, drop the JavaScript code into somebody's web page in order to do the linkage um, in the way that you would likely have to do for uh, uh, realizing node style packaging inside of a web browser context. Um, yeah, that, that's my take. That you you had questions before um, explaining the API. Um, would we would you like to to um, go ahead and ask them? Um, yeah, one of my questions was related to uh, this uh, this distinction between specifiers and absolute. And now you now you've uh, talked about full specifiers. Um, and what, what the expectations are around these things. Um, uh, for example, um, if we have, I guess, what you're calling a full specifier um, for a compart, well, within a, when you instantiated a compartment, um, is, the, is there a requirement that the caching, the memoization is always on a one-to-one -one relationship with full specifiers? If a full specifier is something like a file path, can you uh, intentionally have multiple instances of that module uh, within the compartment um, if the file path is the same, the absolute file path? Um, yeah. Yeah, I can answer that one. Uh, the, <clears throat> inten the intention is indeed that there is a unique module instance for every unique 
uh, full specifier within the scope of a compartment. Um, and that if you want to have uh, <laughs> two arms on your robot, if you will, uh, you have to have more than one compartment. So we should probably discuss that a little bit. There are ways, at least historically, and to some extent now with uh, both import maps and how Node deals with symlinks, uh, two full specifiers currently can point to a single module instance. But there is no way for a full specifier to point to two different module instances. Yeah, um, I think I think I think what you say you're, you're saying what Chris just said is compatible. Is that correct? Yes, yes, it's just expanding upon it. Yeah, it, I think that what you're what you're saying is that the semantics of resolution on a Unix file system, in particular, um, can result in multiple specifiers resolving to the same uh, to to a single specifier in the end. Um, because I, I look at path canonicalization as something that's encapsulated by the resolve hook. So um, it's so it's so it's many, it's a many to one mapping uh, for every full specifier you know within a compartment for every full specifier there's only one module it maps to, but many full specifiers can map to one module. So it's many to one. Yeah, that's reasonable. Yes. Uh, if you do full canonicalization, which is Node's default mode, it would be one to one. However, uh, certain cloud providers use symlinks, which would make it many to one. Okay, that, that was my main question was around um, the semantics of that. Uh, uh, given that the, the compartment is independent of any particular specified scheme. Um, so so from, from just some absorbing I think what you're doing is very interesting. I think this is a very worthy experiment. Uh, I really like Chris's description of the relationship between the two as you know, one is the inside out of the other. Or, um, so I think it's, it's, it's important that both of these uh, experiments uh, are explored. Um, uh, but if they're both going to uh, proceed to be implemented and deployed, then there's the issue about um, what chaos would be creating by their coexistence. So let's do the following test. Uh, can we, without too much pain, emulate each on top of the other? Can we emulate in both directions? I think, um, I, I think a challenge I'm, I'm, I'm going to speculate here. I, I believe that the microbium uh, module system is more general. Um, it, by by not uh, specifying what that, for example, um, uh, uh, what's what's the word? Um, look, for example, that mi a many to many relationship between full specifiers and uh, and module instances. Um, if you have, if you wanted that behavior, you could implement it in this API, but not the compartment API. Um, you, you could pro possibly emulate it over the compartment API by uh, designing a more complicated serialization mechanism for the uh, full specifier. So you could have like uh, instance A colon colon full specifier, and then you parse that. Um, uh, so, so maybe maybe it is possible, but uh, a little bit awkward to implement the other way around. Whereas, I, I speculate that there isn't really any scenario within the, the compartments API specification that that wouldn't wouldn't uh, directly translate to something in the microbium API. Aside from things that aren't implemented, like asynchronous modules, uh, which I'll get to in, in a follow up thing, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. So, I, so I take I take your point. In an earlier phase of the evolution of the compartment API, um, we were exploring um, having uh, uh, full expressivity of mapping from an individual, you know, the, the import namespace for an individual module 
um, uh, by by have rather than that was when we were talking about the three column mapping as we were calling it we were um, mapping from the referrer and the speci the specifier to the uh, module object um, you know to to the the thing to the thing that designates what it is that's being imported and uh, for various reasons we decided to give up that generality uh, and say that there is a resolve that only goes from uh, uh, refer and specifier to full specifier. And then there's separately a compartment specific, you know, compartment based mapping and memo uh, that goes from full specifier um, uh, to module. Um, you know, to the thing that to the thing that specifies what you're importing, uh, and I'm happy with that. But but it, but you're completely correct that there's a loss of expressivity. Uh, that um, that you know that that decision uh, sort of reduced the dimensionality or, or something. I'm not quite sure what the right way to think about it is, but. Um, uh, it did it in a way that's natural for the use cases we have in mind, but it is a reduction in generality. It, it feels to me like the, um, the compartment API has more of a separation of concerns into stuff, which is uh, the responsibility of the compartment API mechanism itself versus what the user is allowed to customize. Whereas, for example, what does a module specifier even mean if, in terms of going from a string to a, to a, 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 a thing that is code? Um, whereas the microbium um, design uh, leaves that open to interpretation by whoever implements the um, import dependency. Well, in a compartment API that's that's implemented in the resolver hook, isn't it? What does a specifier mean? The resolve hook produces the full specifier. It takes in the specifiers and produces full specifiers, uh, and then it's up to the uh, import hook uh, to take in full specifiers uh, and produce module static records. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think the same. Uh, I, th I think the compartment, uh, the compartment implementation or compartment uh, class has a little bit more functionality baked into it. In that, just in that uh, association between um, the full specifier and and the the caching mechanism, the the, the memoization table. Um, mm -hmm. But other than that, I think the separation between inside and outside the API is very similar between the two. This feels spiritually very similar to the, spe uh, to the proposal that Ehab and I made in 2010, where we had proposed that there would just be, that, that, that the modules, that the only primitive that the engine would provide uh, to user space for modularity would be a module constructor function that's very similar to a the function constructor, but it would take uh, a module, uh, a module construction, and it's a string source and a file name, and uh, mm -hmm. and then produce the factory for that module that that, that uh, but uh, th that you would that you would pass its dependencies into. So all of the machinery of creating linkage was on the outside of that. Um, and, and there was quite a, and it would have afforded a lot of flexibility for a, many, many different kinds of module systems all on the same syntax, but with no, again, similarly with no, um, imposing no constraints on how module specifiers were uh, the, on the semantics of module specifiers, other than yes, they are strings. Um, the difference with this proposal and that one is that there's a little bit more going on uh, for linkage um, inside of this, where it's the where if if if, if you were to imagine it, the module constructor would be driving the the linkage of the imports instead of receiving them as arguments. Um, so yeah, uh, in in short, I know where you're coming from. 
<laughs> okay. I think that answers all of my questions. Um, I think most, most of it came up in the discussion while we went through it. So that, that, that was uh, helpful to me. I hope it was helpful to you guys as well to see, see what I've been doing. Um, so, so, so we answered one half of the emulation question, which is we can, we, that the compartment API cannot straightforwardly emulate your API. Uh, what about the other direction? Can your API straightforwardly emulate the compartment API? I believe so from what I understand of it. Um, I, I think the question might be easier for me to answer if we have a more complete documentation of the compartment API. I've been digging into the details of the implementation to try and understand the difference between module and import now and import and all the hooks and everything. Um, but the implementation is not not the clearest way for me to, to uh, understand the, the specified behavior. Um, is it possible to update the proposal with the, um, with the new behavior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I, can, uh, I can elaborate the proposal based off of what we've been writing recently, for sure. Um, and go yeah. into more of the details of the semantics. OK, I, I believe that probably uh, that, that can be implemented in terms of this API. Um, but I, <clears throat> but I would want to actually do the exercise to, to confirm that. I'm uh, noting to myself to go back and visit that. One of the things that came up in this conversation, if I may segue into another topic, um, was uh, top level await, which is uh, something that <laughs> that we will need to at some point actually think about for the compartment shim. Um, and I think that it does have implications for, it does have implications, I think, for um, the API proposal. Um, and perhaps this is a good question for Bradley. Um, do you think, Bradley, that uh, we would need to um, account for top level await by changing the signature of import now to return a promise? Well, we definitely don't need to. So there's an interesting precedent here in uh, the service worker API for uh, browsers. They actually requested that top level await be implemented in such a way that if you do not use it, the graph must evaluate entirely synchronously. Um, and they went so far as to exposing a field on it. Um, I think it's just called sync on your uh, module records, where if you don't have top level weight, it's identifiable as a Boolean. Um, since import now can never uh, really return something that hasn't been initialized, and so you could never return something with top level await if it hasn't been initialized. Uh, we probably don't need to change it. The implication of being able to import stuff before the promise uh, resolves is still a timing issue, but I think the mandate that you uh, can only import now after the promise handlers have been fired for the async version would get around, around that. So the intention is that um, the completion of the execution of your, um, your transitive dependencies from an import would be undetectable except through some other mechanism that the user would have to supply themselves? Well, currently in the spec, it's, it's possible to detect it at the engine level and at the source code level as a programmer, but there's no reflection that exposes that field to anyone. Um, I do know that WASM modules are generally async. There's some gotchas there, uh, but they cannot be loaded synchronously at the start of a service worker. 
just because of them uh, having some async initialization steps. Mm -hmm. uh, so we might be able to get some kind of reflection on what you can load, but at that point you'd already be during runtime and dynamic import would always return a promise. So I don't think it would be useful. Does dynamic import return a promise for the completion of the transitive import graph or just a, um, or does it short at the first top level of weight? Uh, ooh, uh, let's go with the transitive import graph. It will wait until the end of the source text of the root you are trying to import. But only the root, not any of, not any of its, uh, not any of the transitives. All transitives must complete to end of source text before the root begins evaluation. Okay, so there is, so there, is, so the import does provide the mechanism that the user would need if they wanted to detect the completion. Um, even if import now would not, uh, even though import now would return before import promise would resolve after. Can you say that again slower? That was a lot of very specific mm -hmm. words. Yes, um, I'm still I'm still trying to 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 wiggle this out myself. The um, okay, so you have the a, a premise that your the, the execution of a particular module cannot begin. Uh, this the beginning that entering the source text of a particular module cannot begin until. Um, the, its shallow dependencies have all run to the end of their source texts. Is that correct? Yes. Even if those shallow dependencies have a top level of weight. Correct. Okay. Well, that, that helps because that gives us a transitive step. Um, So roughly, there's also limited parallelism. Uh, you only execute in parallel on siblings of the same depth in a um, post-order traversal of your graph. <laughs> I, yeah, OK. That, that's a guarantee. I don't know if it's a guarantee that anyone can use, um, but it's certainly OK. So it's only usable in in the case that you're trying to assert that subgraphs are synchronous. Mm -hmm. um, so you can assert that a subgraph is guaranteed not to interleave any micro tasks during their execution. Since your only question was about if import now needs to return a promise, it explicitly was designed so it did not need to. Okay. So. Uh, it, this is all great. Thank you, Bradley. The, so the first, so, um, so my original question that wasn't phrased particularly well, I'll try again. Um, let's see. Uh, import now returns a promise for, uh, that will resolve after the source text of the specified module has run to completion. To its end. Uh, it, yes, with one added caveat that it cannot return something before the async handlers fire from an async. So if you queue an async module, uh, in order to preserve this uh, very specific thing that TC39 really likes, the right of first access and the inability to synchronously inspect promise state, we need to allow any handlers registered uh, to drain before import now uh, can become usable. Oof, that's a terrible, confusing thing. Roughly, uh, it means at the end of any async import call, so you've completely finished evaluating, 
Oh, there may I, have been I some. To, I need to nail down some terms that you're using yes. freely that I'm not entirely certain what they mean. <laughs> uh, but uh, I let's uh, you, you're saying async import call. Um, I that to to resolve the ambiguity, I'd like to say um, let's refer to the the import function, the import method of a compartment as um, <laughs> as a as simply dynamic import um, because it'll be essentially the same. Um, sure. Um, let's refer to import now as, uh, well, compartment import now as, 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 and then, but then there's a, then the thing that I, I want to distinguish is an async import. Um, let's not use that term. Let's in, instead use the term either dynamic import or import of a module with async top level of weight. Um, if you'd like to shorten the latter to async import, I can live with that. Is that is that what you were trying to refer to? So oh, I'm going to try to use those terms, and I'll restate it. Um, so given an async import uh, using, oh, OK, this is going to take me a second. It's using funny. dynamic import on the compartment API, mm -hmm. uh, the the import now method on the compartment API must not return the uh, value of the promise until all associated handlers of the promise have been drained. Does that, does that part, is it understandable what I said? Even Let me, reason yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm working on understanding first too. <laughs> I'm with you there. Um, when you say must not return, do you mean uh, the promise returned must not resolve? Import now must not oh, return the return module promise. instance. Okay. And so import what should it, it, it? What should it do? Should it throw as unavailable? Uh, I think currently the spec is throwing. Yes. Okay. Uh, if, if, yeah. If it can't, if it cannot immediately return what it's supposed to return. Uh, then it, then throwing is the only other correct thing for it to do. And one of the things that, it, and what you're saying, Bradley, is that the one of the things that it needs to do before it can be safely returned is that you said all handlers of that promise must be drained. Yes. So this is very specific. When you use dynamic import, there is a thing where TC39 has recurringly referred to something without a term. I'm going to call it the right of first access to a promise. Uh -huh. uh, essentially, it comes down to you cannot synchronously inspect the value of a promise. Yes. And if you apply a handler via dot then, dot catch, dot finally, um, et cetera, or a wait, um, they are executed in first in, first out order. So until the um, completion of your dynamic imports module graph, so the end of the source text, it has not been placed into the memo cache, is what we have discussed before. Once it is placed into the memo cache, that is shared between import now and dynamic import, you can use import now to access it, even though it was created asynchronously. Does that match your understanding? Can I in order ask the uh, giga question? Yeah, uh, in order to tease out the distinction between the two behaviors, uh, uh, how would you express this to a programmer? What must they do to be in, to ensure? What must a programmer do to ensure that they may call import now? 
Um, they can do two things. I think you could just try calling it and then call the async version. Um, so that would give you the ability to synchronously access. If you uh, can't access it because of a throw, you can try the async version. Or they could always just call the async version. Is and it then, safe? To, is it uh, is it sufficient to say import? No, do, is it sufficient to await a dynamic import before calling import now? Yes, that would be sufficient. Is there? Huh. All right. There's there is some very very specific <laughs> um, event loop detail here that I'm not entirely sure is observable. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, cool. So the key here is just that when you place something into the cache such that import now can return it, mm -hmm. any, any handler um, that was attached before that point, so if you use dynamic import and then attach a dot then on it, Mm -hmm. must finish evaluation before import now can return that value. Oh, that is strange. Otherwise, we have invalidated something that TC39 has gone to ground on repeatedly. Mark, what do you know about this? Uh, the, I've, so the, the issue that from a promise, you cannot synchronously figure out its content, um, uh, that is, in fact, as Bradley was saying, uh, something that's, that's a invariant that, that TC39 has, um, has preserved. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, Brad, but Bradley's discussion of it in this context uh, is my first exposure to it as having, as I have never thought about uh, what that means in this context. So this is new to me as well. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting thing because what you're talking about is not, um, Bradley, what you're talking about is not observing, um, it, what, what, it's, it's essentially that it's postponing It is postponing the availability of that until this thing that I, has been talked about. We don't have a term for it, so I'm yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I, and I and I think that the term you've invented for it is quite, uh, for one, evocative of uh, historic, awful historical precedents, but also, <laughs> um, also perfectly apt, and possibly also that this might be a terrible historical precedent. Um, the so what you're suggesting is that the so I'm, I'm trying to think about how you would implement this and it's basically i'm i think that the way that you implement this is saying is by having a lower priority queue inside of the promise um uh for um for adding for adding adding the resolution to the cache um such that any any um, any dynamic imports between when um, and any dynamic imports between uh, th before your import now call um, get to be added before that entry in your queue uh, and, and, and uh, is basically basically to implement to implement a naive implementation of compartment for example the one that I've written um, <laughs> is would say uh, would implement import as uh, first an asynchronous call to load the transitive dependencies and, dependencies and link them, followed by dot then, or is just a wait upon that, and then call import now. Um, what you're suggesting is that that is not sufficient, um, that we need to also, I, I think this is how, it, yeah, the way I would implement what you're saying is a requirement according to TC39 would be to say, um, keep a record of every promise I've returned from import uh, for a particular module. 
and uh, also await on promise dot all of those before adding it to the cache such that it is able that it is available to import now and then import now. Is that right? That seems more complicated than what I would have expected a solution to be. Um, a alternative, which has some uh, implementation kinks, which I honestly haven't looked at, would be after you um, finish your import now, uh, well, after you finish evaluating your dynamic import, you've reached the end of your module graph, that is the point in which we want to make it available to import now. We could queue on the same priority a task to do so. That would not allow you to do to await dynamic import and then immediately be guaranteed import now if we did it that way. Because there would be an extra tick. Uh, so that would require another wait. Uh, mm -hmm. before can I ask what does it mean that the that the promise handlers are drained? Um, it does drained mean that uh, all of the all of the handlers have been queued for execution, or does it mean that all of the handlers have been executed? Um, roughly, all the handlers have been executed. There are specific cases, at least in the browser, where you can cancel things. That is. Yeah, that is ultra bizarre. And uh, if you and if a, one handler subscribes another handler, um, is that does that new handler also need to um, need to be drained, or is it only the handlers that were present at the time that the promise was resolved? Historically, we have only discussed shallow, uh, so only uh, a single uh, handler depth. So if you call dot then on dynamic imports results, it would give you right of first access. Uh, and then there is no guarantee after that on the second dot then if you call it a second time of right of first access. But if you got so if you got if you call dynamic import, um, and it returns a promise, and then you dot then on that on that promise, and then within the then callback, you dot then on the promise again. So not the results, not the resolved result, but the um, uh, the original promise. So you, it's still shallow in that you're you're appending the resolution to the same uh, queue. If that makes sense, I, mean, I know it's all the same queue, but the the same queue for the same promise. Um, but you're doing it at a later time. <clears throat> Uh, rather than the earlier time, if that makes sense. Uh, does that still, you, you know what I mean? Like if there's 10 handlers and you append an 11th one while, you, while you're processing handler five, does the 11th one need to be um, drained or not by the time that the first handler uh, call, can call import now? It would not need to be drained according to precedents talked about with uh, polyfills. Mm -hmm. Almost all this discussion is around how polyfills, polyfill asynchronous things. This is very strange. Um, I, I would call it capricious even, which makes me wonder whether I even understand the issue at all. But I'm, I'm content to leave it alone for now, um, if that's all right with everyone. <laughs> uh, it's all right with me. Um, the, what we need, what we practically need the realm shim for uh, Atagoric uh, uh, is, you know, we won't need top level await at all uh, until there are significant legacy libraries that use it that we want uh, code mm -hmm. on Agoric to be able to use those libraries. Until then, um, the, the, as far as the shim is concerned, we can ignore top level await. Yeah. But as far as the proposal is concerned, in order for it to advance a TC39, we have to understand how top level await fits with the overall proposal. And eventually, since the shim is also intended to be a shim that for use by others for the proposal as a whole, uh, there will eventually be pressure there, but not for a long time. Yeah. 
And if, if uh, I'm, I can take Bradley's word for, uh, I think that I now understand why import now will, um, uh, how, how and whether it will, uh, whether it will work with top level of weight. And I, yeah. Um, okay, cool. But, but just to say, Bradley, thank you for convincing me that import now is fine as specified. <laughs> it's fine, but the timing is very strange and specific. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Suffice it to say, I don't even, yeah, I don't even know how one would observe. I, it's it, it, the, this requirement, the way I understand it is capricious in the sense that it does not, um, it does not seem necessary in order to ensure that no one can synchronously observe the state of a promise. I don't see the connection to that. Um, okay, and, so it is more than that, actually. There are two parts. One is not being able to synchronously observe the promise. The other is the ability to polyfill or mutate things in a guaranteed first in first out manner. In order to achieve both, we get into two constraints. For the inability to synchronously inspect a promise, we have to use uh, this memoization table that is only populated at the end of our graph evaluation. Oh, I see, I see, I see. The, 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 what you were saying is not that this is necessary in order to preserve this invariant. It's that because we have this invariant, we must go through extensive you know, go to extensive additional measures in order to ensure a property that's necessary for something else correct um and what is that something else you mentioned polyfills yes so this came up in a variety of ways it's always around polyfills and their ability to take a host provided implementation and replace or mutate it in some manner mm -hmm. um let's say we added promise.remote or something um or that's a bad one temporal uh, <laughs> is a module uh let's say we wanted to polyfill something on tempo temporal can so I, we can i interrupt i want to interrupt with a just terminology clarification in this conversation we have now used both the term shim and polyfill i know of no clear distinction between them did you guys mean to mean two different things, or is that they just synonyms? Yeah, um, me too. I, my understanding is that these are I, these are synonyms. I will just use the word polyfill from now on for illustration purposes. There is no need to differentiate them. Excellent. Um, so for us, we want to polyfill something on temporal. So we attempt to import temporal, and let's say we are the very first. Uh, source text to import temporal, either dynamically or statically. Um, if we are the first to import temporal and we can attach a handler to that dynamic import of temporal, that guarantees we are in a position that we can replace uh, values on temporal with our polyfill such that any source text later will see our replaced values rather than the host implementation. Mm -hmm. I see. This is I... very strange, and I'm sure there are current bugs about this in browsers, but yeah. that is the intent. I think that um, my position on this is, and I suspect that Mark is on the same, uh, uh, is on the same place with this, is that uh, in, in internal to a particular compartment's in, uh, module graph, it is too late to ensure any invariance about the ordering of shims and that vetted shims, shims in general, should be executed beforehand. <laughs> um, I would not disagree, but that is just not the conversations we've had. We could bring yeah. such a conversation to TC39. I think that what I think that the I think that we can only after we have provided an alternative approach and the compartment is uh, the compartment API is the first opportunity in order to create an alternative approach, right? 
um, well, is if you want to have one module graph that, that is internally executed after all of the shims have been executed, there is no such opportunity if you are already inside of a module graph of a particular invisible compartment. Yeah, the, the thing about um, creating alternate you know, bindings or, or is that um, the compartments give you the ability for A, to create a, an emulated environment for B, where, you know, so A controls what B sees rather than uh, to alter your environment from the inside before other things start running. Uh, the, you know, because of the way JavaScript works and, um, you know, shims are, are, you know, are, are doing the customize uh, my, my own world from the inside before I let, um, you know, and then lock it down in the case of, of uh, CES before I then run other code in the, the customized environment that you customize it from the inside. Um, uh, what we're doing, um, you know, in the overall, uh, you know, CES context, uh, now the the we're supporting the vetted shims for uh, the realm wide uh, information, so that you know anything that monkey patches primordials uh, can, has to run um, uh, before the 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 primordials are locked down. Uh, with regard to uh, uh, built-in modules. Uh, the, there's two, the whole issue of how do you shim built-in modules is something that uh, we have yet to um, really face and take a look at all of the different approaches and how they compare. Um, but um, uh, one thing is to, uh, to do it you know, is to say that a built-in module is really just um, more primordial state that you happen to get to in a, in a somewhat different way, but it's just more primordial state um, and therefore should be uh, customized at the time that you customize the other primordials. Uh, the other one is to say that um, uh, it's not, uh, it's more like the global namespace, it's this other import namespace that is not um, uh, where you can, uh, where it's not shared in the same way that the primordials are shared. It's, it's, it's shared or not according to the policy by which that namespace is populated. And just like the compartment is a means for creating a custom popular, a custom um, bindings of global names. It's also a mechanism for creating a custom binding of import namespaces, and therefore you can replace built-in modules or any other modules with replacements of your choosing. Um, and uh, then finally, there's the issue about when you do this customization, do you do it by um, modifying the exported state or by wrapping the module, you know, or by replacing the module as a whole with a module of your own design, which might be a wrapper around the original module. Um, so I don't think this is purely about built-in modules, which maybe I chose a poor example here. Uh, this is about uh, any sort of polyfill that's applied to an asynchronously obtained value. Um, I could probably dig through web APIs and find one for now, but uh, things that are not exported onto the global object, for example, by the web spec and are only available through asynchronous behavior would fall in this category. Okay, so my attitude towards that kind of thing is that anything that, um, anything that's part of asynchronous execution where it, it needs to happen guaranteed before any other thing that touches that state 
um, uh, the that the the other things that need to happen after uh, should not be in that same turn or that same uh, you know messy web of asynchronous execution. There should be an interlock where the thing that needs to go first has to actually have gone before the other things even get scheduled. Um, it's not a question of the order in which then callbacks are registered. It's that the dependent then callbacks shouldn't even be registered until the one that needs to go first has finished. It should be the, the action of the one that goes first that enables or causes the other ones to get registered. So I'm going to use a little bit more computer science -y terms to try to clarify this and what you're saying, Mark. So we are talking about barriers, really. Yes. Um, yes. And if we want to apply a barrier prior to, let's call it application code versus polyfill code. Yes. Uh, or if we want to apply a barrier um, prior to these first access rules that we've talked about historically. Yep. Um, I don't personally have a stake in either of them. I think uh, really we need to talk to Jordan because he, he will be the most more vocal Jordan Harbin that it is. Um, okay. I think at least for Jordan, uh, the viability of doing things, everything at runtime, and particularly as a um, dependency, which is how polyfills are currently loaded in the ecosystem, is proving more and more difficult as we start to have ES modules. Um, particularly top level await invali invalidates sibling guarantees for polyfills in mm -hmm. odd ways. Uh, so we may yeah. be able to apply this barrier you're talking about of uh, the polyfill code must uh, do whatever it does and then a barrier is applied and then other code runs. Yes. Um, that seems perfectly fine to me. Um, Good. You can bring it up. if. If that's the case, Chris, uh, we can actually just remove any of what we talked about. Um, and we can probably just write up that we believe that that is out of scope. And we can document a variety of reasons why. Um, if you want, we can do that. It's fine. Uh, what are you proposing that we, uh, that we would write? Uh, um, so essentially we'd write up a document or issue about uh, reasoning why import now can return immediately after the uh, module graph finishes execution to end of source text. Mm -hmm. And we would be stating that we're going to put this in the memo cache at that point, prior to promise handlers running. Um, we can give a variety of reasons why. One is what Mark said. We want to uh, think of, in particular, this compartment API is having a, um, we could say even programmer employed barrier if they want to uh, provide polyfills. So that means this idea of first access would be programmer responsibility. Yes. Um, which seems fine to me. Um, yeah. Um, well, so what I think that what I that, so what polyfill what folks writing polyfills want is essentially for there to exist an implicit dependency upon the polyfill for um, for anything imported subsequently. Um, because the notion of a polyfill is that whatever's being polyfilled need not know about the polyfill. Um, otherwise it defeats the purpose. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a problem with that due to top level weight now. 
Yes. Top level of weight introduced of race for siblings. Mm -hmm. So what you actually have to do for um, this is, in particular, any asynchronous polyfill, which is the only ones we care about, which uses top level of weight, which they must do in order to maintain their hidden nature, as you say, uh, must go and actually be, number one, the first module imported. Well, it must be imported before any module depending upon it implicitly. Mm -hmm. And it must not be a single depth. It must be two depth because siblings execute in parallel at their depth level. Oof. So you actually must wrap it with a essentially empty file that just imports your polyfill using top level of weight. Wait, are there, is there such a thing as an asynchronous polyfill? Uh, yes, there are very extremely few. And if we ever introduce filter modules, that is one of the discussion points. Oh I, I, have a, I have a hard stop at three. I have a meeting that begins at three. I think um, we're just explaining the write-up at this point, Mark. Yep, yep. Sounds good. And I can hang out with Brad Bradley if uh, um, after the call, if uh, in order to fill in the minutes and find out uh, what our action items are from here. Um, my suspicion is that we can pivot this entire discussion to being uh, a presentation of an opportunity for a better way to do polyfills than what you have to do today in order to guarantee these um, the implicitness of a polyfill in a container. Uh, I would agree. Um, really, oh. it's just going down to like the assumption of polyfills being able to have this right of first access is incredibly hard to do these days. And it, to the point where even if you do it right, I can probably invalidate it if I try. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> so if that's the case, um, we can we can probably, you know, state that we're we're fine just invalidating this right of first access or whatever you want to call it for polyfill. Yeah, uh, yeah, because we also have, and, and and also because we have a better alternative we can propose. Um, I do not have a better alternative. To I mean, the, I mean that the compartment API affords us an opportunity to execute all shims before any user code in the compartment executes. Within the compartment, yes. Yeah. Hey, bye, guys. All right. Thanks, Mark. Bye. Right. Um, okay, I'll drop off the call as well then. Okay. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Uh, all right. Well, do, uh, do you have a uh, do you have a few mo uh, a few moments, Bradley, to to iron out what we write down? Sure. Um, uh, so I'm just taking a look at the minutes, and let's see. So uh, I'm just going to add a a, a a to do. So our action uh, is. Uh, um, mm, I. Uh, what's your what's your what's your what's your TC thirty nine monogram, Bradley? Uh, BFS. <laughs> and you favor bread first, I assume. <laughs> All right. Sure. Um, oh um, yeah, yeah. This this fits the pattern. Got it. Um, okay, so. Uh, can uh, you, I, I'm going to volunteer you to. Um, I can just document the issue. Oh, come yeah, on. Doc document um, the. Really, the just we need to document async polyfills in regard to when the memo cache is populated for import now. Woo. Uh, yeah. Um, The, regarding the um, uh, 
how populated uh, shows how allows for now alternate alternative ways to or user code within a compile. For the top level realm, people will be kind of meh, angry about it, but I think since it only applies to compartments, it, it might fly. Uh, this is actually, I mean, the, if somebody, this, this is actually quite, uh, the top level realm folk are probably absolutely right that the shims should be applied to the top level realm, not to the compartment. Um, um, and, and yeah, perhaps uh, that, that is, So um, it's an interaction, right? It's like you apply it, you would use the realm to apply your polyfills and then introduce a compartment for the user code that depends upon the execution of the, of the polyfills. In theory. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it's going to be a very hour long discussion with people. Is it a discussion we have to have or is it one we can brush underneath the floor? Uh, I'm going to try to brush it under the floor and I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> so uh, perhaps what we can do is be prepared for it to surface um, without raising it ourselves, because that's fine by me. Because yes. like, like brushing, it, it, from my perspective, just implementing the feature, um, imp implementing compartment import in terms of import now, um, without taking these considerations into account seems fine. Um, especially since we haven't even bothered to, to implement top level await, so the concern doesn't even exist yet. Um, at least in the shim. Uh, gosh. Yeah, oh. We have a separate thing in Node um, that we're going to have to port over to this API eventually. But. Mm -hmm. Do you expect difficulty there? Um, everything's difficult in Node, so yes. <laughs> yeah. All right. Cool. Um, but like to put it in perspective, we don't have frozen anything in Node Core, so mm -hmm. that's the difficulty. Yeah. 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 It's not going to be any more difficult than anything else. OK, cool. Um, All right. For the API features, I think the only thing we have minor concern with is nesting. But eh, sure. What kind of nesting? Um, so we talked about this a few weeks back. Um, so date, uh, regex. Oh, yes. A few others are getting attenuations and how they propagate across nested compartments um, needs to be clarified. Yes, um, I think that uh, Michael Fig had similar, um, a similar issue to raise. And I think I'll, I'll, okay, since we're talking about it now, I'll, and I'll uh, actually remember to put it on the agenda for next week. Um, Roughly, it's uh, the same as the Shia ch root escape problem so mm -hmm. yeah um crap how did i forget to do this how did i forget how to use my keyboard while i was at it oh, oh there it is oh, oh that one um the uh thing to bring up is uh um endowment api for endow so that has propagate your child compartments versus those that do not. And um, I think I'll generalize this to endowments uh, and hooks for 
Uh, which, what specific hooks are we concerned about? Behaviors of regex or uh, what are we attenuating that, we, that we're concerned about? So we're providing this idea of endowments. Uh, let's just use number dot math dot random. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, as an example, if we create a compartment that we have removed math dot random with an attenuation, we mm -hmm. there are there is confusion on what happens when we create a second compartment that is nested within the censored compartment. Yes. If currently, historically, you would get access to math.random mm -hmm. because the endowment would um, not censor uh, the entire tree. It only censors one level deep. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, OK, cool. We'll bring that up next week. Um... I have to go now. So yep, that's good. I'll talk right. to you later. Thank you. See ya.